Good evening, and welcome to episode three of season two of Mind Wars Forum. We're really pleased uh, this evening uh, to be welcoming uh, William Isom from uh, Director of Black and Appalachia. We'll be bringing him on here in just a second. Uh, we just had a, an incredible weekend at the Mind Wars Museum. Uh, our building, which is owned by UMWA Local 1440, was dedicated to UMWA President Cecil Roberts. We had a wonderful event for our members and a talk with Roger May on his Then and Now exhibit this weekend. And it was our first big event since the pandemic and also our first big event since we were in the new place in Mate One. And we had a ton of people come out. So we want to thank all of our members that came out for that, all the people in Mate One that came out for that and the UMWA Local 1440 and all the folks that they did. It was just really a great weekend. It was great to see all my fellow board members and Kenzie and Kimberly and, and, and everybody else. And so it was a great weekend. Uh, if you didn't make it, make sure that you try to come down for later events that we're going to have. Of course, we've got the Blair Centennial coming up on Labor Day weekend. Make sure that you uh, are uh, aware of that. You go on the Blair 100 site to get all of the details. We're going to be putting on a, a new segment uh, in future episodes here where our museum director, Kenzie, is going to come on and give you updates and announcements that I kind of try to fumble through at the beginning of each episode. But Kenzie is going to come on and do a segment uh, soon, not not tonight, but soon she's going to come and do a segment that's going to give you all the updates on that. Just spoke to her before the broadcast and she cannot wait to get in front of the camera and give you all of that information and uh, do her little segment. So we're looking forward to that. And so anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and bring on William and uh, get the conversation started. How you doing, William? Good. How you doing? Doing well, doing well. Um, really glad that you were going to take the time uh, to come on here and talk to us. Um, you are, of course, a Red Bandana Award winner and the director of uh, Black and Appalachia. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Red Bandana Awards, it's a little award ceremony that we do every year. Uh, it's a new tradition that we've started at the Mine Wars Museum. And you were winner of the Truth Teller Award, correct? Yeah, that was a, a very touching surprise for me. Um, that was a, that's a high honor. I have it, I have it on my wall. Great. Well, uh, you're absolutely fitting for it and um, couldn't think of anybody better this year. So we're glad that uh, you could come on and talk to us and tell our members a little bit more about what you do and uh, what you're working on now. And so I'm looking forward to this discussion. So to get uh, to get us started here, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your background. I always ask everybody about uh, to tell you know, to tell our audience a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up? Uh, what was your childhood like? That kind of thing. Yeah, I, I grew up in rural Hamblin County, Tennessee, close to um, the Nullichucky River and near the Cock County line. So if you guys know Cock County, it borders the Smoky Mountain National Park. And so that's where I grew up at. I grew up in uh, in a rural community. And uh, my, me and my, my parents and my brother, and uh, I had a couple of sisters also. And uh, yeah, I just had like a typical country kid uh, childhood where I played in the creek and caught crawdads and got in trouble for getting too dirty and rode my bicycle and scuffed my knees and mm -hmm. shot my BB gun at the cows and things like that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I... Uh, that's where I grew up until I was uh, a teenager. And then, uh, and then we moved to town, which was a whole nother animal, but town being Morristown, Tennessee. <laughs> so that was yeah. the closest thing yeah. that I, I knew to a city. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I grew up. My family has been in, uh, in the area in Southwestern Virginia and East Tennessee for, for as long as there, we got records. So, uh, mostly my folks have been uh, from Wise County, Virginia, coal mining communities or agricultural communities in the what I call what I call the industrialized valley, which is mm -hmm. uh, the Holston, Nolichucky River Valley. So farming, raising hogs, sharecropping. Uh, yeah. 
So I'm going to ask about this. You used to shoot BB guns at cows. Yeah, maybe I should have said that. Like, uh, <laughs> I think uh, uh, I think that was like flashing back. And well, the reason I ask, I used to shoot BB guns, but me and my friends, we always shot at birds. Oh um, no, that was my my dad uh, was not that. Do you remember that episode of the Andy Griffith show where uh, Opie shot the the bird out of the tree with his BB gun? Okay, yeah, and, yeah I think and I his, that. Andy was very upset with him. And so <laughs> right. similarly, when I got my BB gun, I was a goof around the yard and dad was like, don't shoot into nests. So I had like this double reinforcement of Andy Griffith and my father telling me not to shoot birds. So I didn't. Well, we can't disappoint both your father and Andy Griffith. So uh, uh, we have to we have to keep that on the level. All right, sorry, sorry. I had to I had to bring that back up. I've never. Uh, did the cows even feel it? No, they didn't seem to like respond. But uh, you shouldn't do that, kids. Don't shoot BB guns at cows. That's, that's okay. right, kids. Don't shoot BB guns at cows or birds. That's or bad. Birds. Yes, squirrels or or rabbits or whatever you know, no. or each other. We sometimes <laughs> shot at each other too. Um, There's some. St- some stories there. I got in trouble. Yeah, yeah, that can happen. All right. Uh, BB gun safety uh, aside and shooting aside. Um, so you talk about your, your youth growing up. Well, when you went to high school, how big was your high school? Oh, that's a good question. I'd say probably about 2000. Wow. Morristown, Morristown East, which there was two high schools, Morristown East and Morristown West. And they uh, were the two high schools that served the whole county. So um, it's a, it's a small county, but it's a, it's a, got a, you know, the city's like 35,000. Okay. And then they, I don't, I'm not sure what the county is, but it's a, uh, for the area, it's, it's town. It's the closest thing you can get to town. Okay. Yeah. That's a pretty big high school. Uh, or at least it is in, in the high schools that I grew up in. Uh, I had 87 people in my graduating class. So I was a small single A school uh, in Lincoln County, West Virginia. So you started doing research eventually. And I know that you do, uh, when we talk about Appalachia, you know, we talk about family, the significance of family. What got me into Appalachian history was of course my family history. And that's what drew me to it. That's what drew me into the field of history. What role did family play uh, in your uh, kind of research and uh, what drew you into your studies and, uh, and to talk a little bit about that for me. Yeah, that was, that's similarly family history was kind of the, the, the it, itch that kind of pushed me, pushed me on down the road to, to even be interested in history. I had a history teacher, uh, Bill Henderson, uh, eight, in eighth grade, they teach us Tennessee history, East or Tennessee history. And he really sparked, helped spark my brain as a as a really engaging teacher and probably around that time like i really got interested in researching my own family's history my mom's family history she's from appalachia virginia in wise county and her stuff was all like there was a book like one relative had a book and it went all the way back to you know moses or whatever so it went all the way back to like england and Mm -hmm. uh so but my father's side of the family, there was very, there was nothing. There was very few photographs, even of my grandparents, his parents. And so that's what really drew me in was like trying to flush out those stories. And this was before the age of the internet. So it was, you go to the history center or, I mean, you go to the local library in Morristown, the Morristown Hamblin library, and you pull out the drawer with the cards in it and mm-hmm. oh yeah yeah so there wasn't even a computerized search uh for the library but that's kind of where i cut my teeth on doing mm-hmm. historical research was researching my own family's history and you know it took me you know it took me 20 years uh to to really track down the isom uh line to emancipation and that moment of emancipation in scott county virginia Gate City, Virginia, uh, 20 years. And that was recently. So, and I found that uh, doing research for an, another project in Lee County, Virginia, about a slave cemetery. So, uh, yeah, I, that's where I cut my teeth at 
uh, is just doing my own family's research. And, and I got really good at it because I learned to do it before the internet. Mm -hmm. And so you learn to like, take your time and look through every book in that, in those little history rooms in libraries, because there may be one paragraph in there that's invaluable. Um, and oftentimes that's all you're going to find is like one paragraph mm -hmm. about the black community. And then that's all. Yeah. Yeah. I like that you mentioned though, before that you learned your, to cut your teeth before the internet. I, and I was on that cusp too. I didn't get an email address till my junior year in college. Yeah. So the, the internet was just coming on. And so I also, you know, have the experience of if you need something, you have to go to the library you have to look through the cards and you have to, find things. My students now, it, it, they can't, I don't know, I don't think they can find their own shoes if they, if they can't do a Google search for it. So it's, it's really the internet is convenient and as wonderful as certain aspects of it are, it's really hurt, uh, I think, our ability to try to find things outside of a screen. I, so, I, will, I will say that though now that I'm in my 40s and I have, you know, access to other resources like databases and I can pay for a subscription to ancestry and I can like mm -hmm. pay for a subscription to newspapers.com like that, ha that access also continues to open doors for doing research. Um, sure. Whereas, you know, in my twenties or, you know, I, I'm not, I could, was eating ramen noodles, you know, it wasn't getting that uh, ancestry account. Well, they, mm -hmm. they didn't exist, but you know, mm -hmm. That's something that um, I think also has been beneficial lately, mm -hmm. past you know, 10 years or so. Well, ramen noodles, that was the breakfast of champions for all, uh, I think, college undergrads for a long time. Uh, and the dinner sometimes of champions, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so we had a lot of that. Um, so you, you went into your family history and what was the most interesting thing that you found uh, other than you know, the emancipation that you mentioned a little bit earlier? Was some, is there anything in your past or something that really struck you or, or that, that stays with you? Yeah, I think the, I mean, probably the, the biggest pieces that stick with me are those emancipation narratives that, mm -hmm. that then you're able to find that point where they are, were listed as nameless property and then given names and oftentimes uh, prices, price tags. And so you see your ancestors with, fin they finally have a name and then they also have a price tag on them. And so I think that that, those two, in particular, my, with uh, Kelson Isom, Isom, his emancipation, one of the most interesting things that I think I found was a note. So his slave owner, had died and in the estate they leased the his slaves out to other family members and neighbors and so the the estate was still making money off of their labor after the slave holder had died hmm. and so because of that there were notations from the administrator of the estate in the court records or court books for taxes and things and so it got to be 1865 and this, there was a new set of handwriting. It looked like a new clerk. And he said, whether or not these slaves were worked after the fall of Richmond, I cannot say. Mm -hmm. So the fall of Richmond was the end of the Confederacy, the formal end of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. And he was saying whether they worked these people after emancipation or not, I, I, I'm not saying. So he was trying to cover his own tail. Mm -hmm. at least in the paperwork. So that was really interesting to me. And I have went to uh, two houses are still standing. Two of the plantation houses are still standing. So I've went and knocked on doors and talked to people. Uh, and that's been really interesting too. Yeah. Uh, I bet that would be really, uh, how, what are the state of those buildings? Uh, uh, there people are living in them. Wow. Yeah. One of them's a century farm. Okay. Uh, in Hawkins County, in St. Clair, in Hawkins County, Tennessee. And so there's a special designation that you can get as a century farm. It's been operated as a farm for more than a, th a hundred years. So, um, okay. Yeah. So you did that. I want to return back to, to, to that in a moment, but there, there's some other questions about the, when, when you were just getting going here in your career, 
I understand through Lou, who uh, sent me some, uh, Lou sent me some tips on some things to ask you here. So I got to give a shout out to Lou for helping me out here with this one. Big up to Lou. Yes. Um, if he's watching, uh, I think he's going to Vegas this week. And so uh, he, hopefully he's going to win some money for the museum. That's what we're, um, that's what we're hoping for. Uh, but anyway, uh, he mentioned to me that you started a radio station at some point. Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't start a radio station. I have participated in the, the work of some community radio stations. You, there, uh, so just kind of give you a, a rundown of that stuff. Um, there, and I, you got to kind of watch your language. Um, there was, a. Uh, I was a supporter of uh, a pirate radio station. Like I was a fan of theirs mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> they, it was called KFAR. It was called Knoxville's first amendment radio. And so this was during George W. Bush's, this baby Bush, baby Bush's first term. Uh, and so that was uh, my first experience with a community owned media outlet. Uh, so it wasn't long before the, the U S marshals came and took all that stuff away. But, um, out of that experience, uh, uh, started participating in, there's an organization, a national organization, I think out of Philadelphia called the Prometheus radio project. Mm -hmm. And they were instrumental in helping com community radio stations get established by nonprofits, often low power FM stations. And so uh, through them and with them, I worked with, you know, WRFN, which is Radio Free Nashville, uh, W, oh, I had to write it down, uh, WMXP, which was Malcolm X Grassroots Radio in Greenville, South Carolina, and WGXC, which is a, a, is a full power FM station in Hudson, in the Hudson Valley of New York. Um, so just being around what they call barn raisings, where they do hands-on workshops and they actually get the radio stations up and running through the weekend. Um, but locally here in Knoxville, there's WOZO, uh, Wozo FM that's housed at the Birdhouse Community Center in Knoxville. So I, I did assist with that application process and getting that going. Um, and it's a low power FM station that's on the air now uh, in Knoxville and so, but. There's a, it takes a lot of people to set up and run mm -hmm. a radio station. So um, I'm just a little tiny piece, piece part of, of these things. And I, I do want y'all to know, and maybe your listeners too, that uh, I have been told that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission is getting ready, I think next year to open up the window for more community groups to apply for low power FM radio stations. Mm -hmm. So particularly in rural areas. So if you're in a rural area uh, and you're a nonprofit um, and you got space, uh, you can potentially apply next year. And uh, the Pro Prometheus Radio Project is a good good place to to fish around and and see. They have some information sheets and stuff on mm -hmm. there. But um, just so if anybody up that way uh, gets the itch, uh, you can learn how to set up your own radio station. That's good to know. I like the Prometheus name, uh, rebelling against Zeus there. Uh, I always like the Prometheus story. So what kind of programming uh, did, did some of these stations have? What kind of music uh, what were we looking at? What? Um, most of these, if not all of these stations, had a very eclectic mix. Everything from bluegrass to underground hip hop to, you know, most of them, I'd say maybe all, most of them ran like Democracy Now or like Pacifica radio shows. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, very lefty news, um, often from the West Coast. And um, yeah, uh, but it usually ran the gamut. And I think that that was the beauty of a community radio station. You'd have some of the weirdest, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the local hippie would get on and just play like psychedelic music for two hours on a right. Sunday. Um, so I, I think almost all of them that was just like ran the gamut. I, I think those things are important because first of all, you know, on, on your major radio, you know, your mainstream radio stations, I know a couple of DJs and they don't ever pick, you know, what they play. 
it's chosen for them by, by, by corporate headquarters, you know, their daily rundown. So they never get to choose what they do. And I think we miss a lot of that. I listen to a lot of music and listen to a, try to listen to radio uh, whenever it's good. And it's, uh, it's, it's so much more valuable when DJs can choose their own stuff because they're going to give you things that you're not going to get otherwise. And you can kind of see their personality come through. So and it's people that, you know, and nobody's getting paid to do a community radio station mm -hmm. show. So it's not like any paid DJs. So it's just like John from down the road and his show about gardening or hiking or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think those things are important though. It's uh, hopefully there, there can be more of those. And, and uh, you guys saw uh, the, the message down there. So hopefully some people will check that out and who knows, maybe we'll see some more spring up in the area. I know I'm not going to spring one up. I've got too much on my plate, but you never know. Some other people that are watching may do that. So um, let's get to Black and Appalachia. How does this get started? Where did this come from? Uh, take me through that, the origins. Uh, when did the idea spring up to you? Yeah, so uh, it was named, the project was originally named Blacks in Appalachia after the book by Will, uh, William Turner and Ed, mm -hmm. Edward Cabell. And so just as a nod to them, and uh, how it got started, apart from the name, uh, was I, I work at East Tennessee Public Television in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, we were approached by my cousin, Stella Gudger, at the Price Public Community Center and Swift Memorial Institute Museum. In it's a, basically a community center that she helped put together and a small museum okay. in Rogersville, Tennessee. And so she said, Hey, I got a little bit of funding. Uh, can you, will you guys, can you guys produce like a, a short documentary about Swift Memorial Institute, which is a historically was a historically black college in Rogersville, Tennessee in Hawkins County in East Tennessee. And uh, so most things with public television, if, if there's fun, if funding exists, we can do it. And so mm -hmm. we were like, okay, cool. We will help you. And, the goal was to create something that would be for eighth graders. So if eighth graders come by the museum on a field trip, then they could watch the film and learn all about the museum. I mean, learn all about the school. So we did that. And uh, my, my boss, uh, Chris Smith, who's the director of production development at East Tennessee PBS, he was like, we got a really good response. People uh, were so excited about this little short documentary that we did. Uh, and he was like, we should, we should keep doing this. And I was like, okay, cool. And so I took off and, uh, we just kept doing it. So we, mm -hmm. then we worked on some longer projects, um, around the 8th of August. So, so for about three years, we worked to document the 8th of August, which is our region's emancipation celebration, uh, because Andrew Johnson freed his personal slaves on the 8th of August, 1864. Okay. Um, so, or 1863. Um, so out of that, we just continued to do these short documentaries, very locally specific, but then also in doing this work, a greater, there was always in my mind as someone who had, whose family was from the region and I'm dealing with these associated families I began to recognize that there was a greater need, like it's fine to go in and make a documentary about something, but I'm seeing like all these other holes that are in the narrative, um, very locally, uh, county by county when we're doing this work. And I was seeing like people's materials, uh, boxes of, of invaluable photographs and stuff just in, in drawers and in people's like Rubbermaid containers. Uh, and people were keeping them safe and they were taking care of them, but they weren't available. I think that the inavailability of those items kind of helped to foster the narrative that maybe there weren't black communities in, in some of these places. Mm -hmm. And so when it absolutely was not true, it was like, these are very, these are areas that have very rich black populations and black histories. 
And so I wanted to try to continue to do everything that we could to help flesh that out and help those community members tell their stories in whatever way that we could. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, I wanted to go back to the documentaries. I, I've watched a number of them and uh, they're really good. I mean, I really, really like those little documentaries. I particularly like the one about the uh, Knoxville riots, 1919. Uh, that time period right after World War One, in which there's so much going on in regards to labor uprisings, uh, Tulsa massacre, uh, race rights and increased and rejuvenated KKK, uh, anti-immigration, all, all of that. And I didn't know all the details of the Knoxville riots. Uh, I really, really liked that one. There's a few more. Uh, there's a good one on out migration that focused on uh, the, the blackout migration uh, after World War II that I thought was really good. Uh, do you have a favorite one that uh, if one person says, you know, give me one example of one of these documentaries, which one would you hand them and say, this is what, this is one that you got to watch? Well, it's interesting because some of the, some of the ones that I do, like, I don't like to go back and watch. I'm like, uh, mm -hmm. I, cause you see little things that you do differently now. Like, so I've been doing this for 10 years or coming up on 10 years. So, uh, I see some things and I also like, I'll see my mistakes. Mm -hmm. so, so I would have to say probably the most recent one is about the Corbin expulsion where they exp expelled the black population out of Corbin, Kentucky in, yeah, 19, yeah. in 1919. And, and these are shorter ones. And uh, similarly, we did one about Irwin, Tennessee, when they expelled, they lynched Tom Devert in 1918. Uh, railroad town and they uh, expelled the black population out of Irwin, Tennessee in a year before. Uh, so that story I think is really important and people don't realize it because Ir I don't know if you know about Irwin, Tennessee, but the, the claim to fame is that they hung an elephant there mm -hmm. in, in 1916. And I think poor, I mean, in some ways I, I, I feel sorry for, for her one because of uh, they hung the elephant just because it was the closest place to have a, a thing long enough to hang an elephant. But in, in a lot of ways, it's also like, you know, they expelled their entire black population and then maintained themselves as a sundown town for, you know, until very recently. And so, uh, but I would to answer your question, the Corbin expulsion is, is probably the most inter interesting to me right now because of the, you know, we had, we got an illustrator to help illustrate some of the story because there's only so many photographs from 1919, um, or newspaper articles that you can show people. And so in order to tell the story, we used an illustrator, which I thought was really uh, a really creative way to tell that story. It is a really creative way to tell it. And I watched the Corbin uh, documentary. And can, can you just give a, uh, just a, a tiny rundown of what that is for, for our viewers who don't know? Because a lot of this is not, I always talk about mind wars as something that you don't get in the classroom. This is absolutely stuff that you don't get uh, in, in the classroom, certainly not secondary, even in college classrooms, when there are like only three uh, blacks left in Corbin after that expulsion. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, that uh, they'd hit out one uh, one in a basement, another uh, lady hit out uh, in a white family's home. Mm -hmm. uh, but can you can you give a, a little rundown uh, of what that what happened there? Yeah, uh, October thirtieth, nineteen nineteen, and I think it may have been even the day before that. But uh, there was a Corbin had beat was a um, became a hub for the, all the coal that was coming out of Eastern Kentucky, mm -hmm. Eastern Kentucky coal fields. And as a consequence, the, the railroad receiving yard was being expanded and expanded and the, the roads were being made, uh, improved and expanded. And so uh, who's going to do the labor? Uh, uh, they brought a lot of black workers in from Lexington and Louisville and from mm -hmm. down South. And uh, for, so for whatever reason, uh, there was a, a, a white man, white worker that got robbed, may have been a black guy that robbed him, some black guys that robbed him, may have been some white guys in blackface that robbed mm -hmm. 
Nevertheless, what happened was uh, this guy, Pistol Pete Rogers, Steve Rogers, got um, uh, a bug up his butt and got. He, they called him Pistol Pete because he liked to wave his gun around. And mm -hmm. so uh, he gathered up basically this, this could have been lynch mob, and they went and rounded up these temporary workers and put them on a train to Knoxville and Lexington, but similarly started, wasn't satisfied with that. They started going to black residents' homes and uh, looting their homes and running them out of, to the train station to leave town too. And uh, as a consequence, um, they, um, and they used a march, they commandeered a marching band, which is really, really odd thing. They made the marching band march around and play music while they were doing this racial expulsion. Um, Stephen Rogers was convicted, uh, spent, I think maybe a year in, in jail. Um, and then, but then the town of Corbin over the past hundred years, uh, had a reputation and had signs according to some people like Bill Turner that basically, you know, black people weren't allowed in Corbin after the sun went down. And so this tradition and this, this scar on the city of Corbin, uh, kind of festered uh, for the past hundred years after that. And, and the word of mouth amongst the black community, even in Tennessee, it was like, well, uh, we don't go through there. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so that's, that's the story. And, and there's a group in, in Corbin, Kentucky and the university of Kentucky called the sun up initiative. And they're working to, and the mayor of Corbin is involved with it um, to, to fix to fix things uh, as much as they can be fixed to repair that irreparable, but they're, they're, they're making an effort towards uh, racial reconciliation. Yeah. You kind of went right into what I was about to ask next is, is how does the community deal with that memory uh, deal with that? We're, we're, we're having something uh, of a reckoning in the United States. Now I wouldn't say it's a full on reckoning, but it's uh, you're definitely seeing more attention being paid to public memory uh, and the South and uh, racism and the structural problems that, that we've had in this country for, for since its inception, since before its inception, actually. Uh, and so uh, do you think that uh, Black and Appalachia is uh, kind of a catalyst for, uh, for, for bringing those things to light and kind of redressing all of uh, these uh, huge omissions uh, of the American story? Yeah, I think that I, I see Black and Appalachia as just uh, contributing to the narrative in the way that I think in the way that these, this, this story about Corbin, like we knew not to go to Corbin, but we didn't know why. Okay. You know, and I think uh, Corbin being a sundown town we didn't know why that was why it was a sundown town. And so I think black and Appalachia's role is to, to, cause the information's out there, like just to compile it and put it in a concise digestible form so that people can uh, get, get the facts as much as they exist and, and make, you know, make up their own minds mm -hmm. around. I mean, there's not really a mind to make up, to just mm -hmm. get the facts around, around some of these things. And, and that's kind of how I view everything that we do is like, the pieces are out there. We just need to consolidate some of these pieces into digestible narratives so that people can uh, absorb them. Um, yeah, because we know the stories are there, just like the Knoxville uh, Red Summer that you were talking about. I had always heard about it, but I didn't know the, the facts. I didn't know mm -hmm. what was the real story. And I think having that real story on hand, I think, is, is, is invaluable. And it's uh, Knoxville is just a crazy story anyway, because you had machine guns in the streets uh, of Knoxville. And uh, and also, I, I think it's a, an important part of the narrative that you saw uh, black citizens in town fighting back mm -hmm. uh, and, and defending themselves and, and, and not being passive uh, of accepting this terrorism uh, that was taking place. You mentioned also the term sundown towns, mm -hmm. right? 
And it's not a term that I've heard in West Virginia. I've heard it in mm. Kentucky and Tennessee, but I've not heard that term in West Virginia. And that's not necessarily saying that West Virginia's was any better by no means. Uh, but I've just, it's just not a term that, uh, that, that I've heard uh, here. Can you explain to some of our viewers what sundown town is and how, how prevalent was that when you were growing up? Yeah. Uh, so a sundown town is basically a no go zone for black folks. It's uh, a, has been a place where often they call it a sundown town because they say, you know, don't let the sun set on your black, on your black ass. And so mm -hmm. sometimes they would paint a black, black donkey on the sign or on the side of a, on a rock leading into town. So if you saw that, you knew, and this is way back in the day, you saw that and you knew like, okay, like this is a town not to linger around after, after the sun goes down. And so that's kind of where the term, came from and they were not just relegated to the South. The sundown towns were all over the country, uh, particularly in the Midwest, any place where they wanted, as black folks were migrating uh, across the country, it was a, a way to stop black settlement in some places. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, they were all over the country uh, in the North, in the Midwest, uh, of course, all over the South and uh, I've heard, and I don't have those on hand, but um, uh, there were sundown towns in West Virginia as well. I'm um, sure there were. Uh, people have chimed, chimed in whenever we started uh, sharing some of the information that we had, and uh, they they named a couple of places, but I I don't I can't remember the names of those places right now. Oh, I, I know the name of a few places where uh, you know near uh, towns near you know in southern West Virginia where uh, black people weren't welcome uh, after dark, but I just hadn't heard the term. Yeah, uh, that that specific term, same practice, just not. Yeah, and and we didn't call them sundown towns as as when I was learning how to drive. Like I was just my dad just said, it, particularly Irwin and Corbin, and there was, um, you know, like Strawberry Plains, Tennessee, which is between like Morristown and Knoxville, uh, places that may or may not have had heightened Ku Klux Klan activity as my dad was growing up. So in the six fifties and sixties, like places that he knew that, that had clan, he called it clan land. Okay. He didn't call it sundown towns. He was like, no, he's like, that's clan land. And that's all he would say. And I would know what he meant. And mm -hmm. so we just didn't go to those places um, at all. Right. Okay. Well, good. I'm glad that we uh, got into that a little bit. And again, I want people to, to, go to uh, your website and you can also go on YouTube. A lot of these videos are on YouTube and I hope that teachers that are watching and just people that are interested in expanding their horizons on uh, regional and racial history can go there and watch those. I really highly recommend them. And, and I think that you do a fantastic job uh, producing those, those videos. I think they're really important and really well done. And again, I love the artwork uh, on the Corbin. It's, it's, it's really, really interesting. And there's teachers guides. So if you're a teacher, there's on the website, there's teachers guides that you can download. Uh, everything that we do we, is for free. So we, it's all on YouTube, all wherever. So. Okay, great. Let's talk about cemeteries. Okay. Um, this is, uh, I could probably spend a long time talking about cemeteries. Uh, and I've got a little personal connection to cemeteries. Uh, my dad, uh, for many years, he was a salesman for many years, and then he b started managing cemeteries. He was a oh. cemetery manager for a number of years, and uh, he managed a number of cemeteries in West Virginia, and it's big business. Cemetery business is big business. You know, there's around four or five corporations that control about 85% of the cemeteries in America. What? Stop yeah. cemetery consolidation. That's the next. Yeah. Word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's one company that owns uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 major cemeteries in West Virginia alone, uh, as well as Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, so yeah, the, there's some big cemetery uh, corporations out there. But anyway, uh, so anyway, I grew up. My dad has all these cemetery stories. He has lots of crazy stories from cemeteries. You know, families get into fights over monuments and where to put family members and uh, moving people from one place to another and uh, just all kinds of just crazy stories. But I'm really interested in uh, your work on cemeteries and you begin documenting cemeteries and doing some research in that. So talk to me a little bit about that aspect of your research and what's going on there. Yeah. So uh, the cemetery work 
is, as you know, uh, uh, a much slower kind of work than uh, any other component. Um, the One of the main cemeteries that we worked on was uh, a slave cemetery in Lee County, Virginia. And uh, it was on Amy Clark's land. She's a teacher at a uh, professor at UVA Wise in Wise County, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had grew up with that cemetery there and uh, she was ready to like take it on and like try to figure out who was buried there. And I swear that that has been the most vexing research project uh, I've ever participated in. Uh, so we, we started out uh, just trying to research and we went to through every book that we could find in the, the basement of the Lee County, Virginia courthouse, uh, trying to figure out the goal was like, we knew that there were fields. It was just field stones with no names on them. Mm. Uh, mm. We just wanted some names and she wanted to memorialize them in some way. Um, and uh, to no avail, like there was no, no red record, no mention the land records didn't mention a cemetery. None of the deeds mentioned the cemetery, but she knew that there were, her family was, were potentially the, the slaveholders of these people. Um, so she cleaned it up, her and her husband cleaned it up and, and we documented the process of trying to find out who these people were. Luckily she got a professor from Radford uh, to come and do the ground penetrating radar. Mm -hmm. So that at the very least, these things, we can map the cemetery and we can uh, register it with the state. And so the, the, those are the two primary components because you don't always get, there's not always a conclusion. There's not always a, a successful resolution to a research project. And I think that that's uh, something that, that people don't talk enough about. Like uh, sometimes there actually is no information. And right. So what do we do? We preserve it, we map it, we put the information out there and, and that's all you can do. Um, there, so similarly, um, there's a cemetery. So what we do generally with cemeteries is try to make sure that they're documented and in at, at the very least find a grave, uh, the find a grave website or photographed and those photographs and information is are in the county um, uh, archives, whatever whatever mm -hmm. county library or historical society. We try to photograph, document it, get it registered to the state, and oftentimes that's that's as much as we can do. We don't do any like cleanup mm -hmm. or preservation beyond the documentation and making sure that the information is available, particularly through find a grave, and a lot of the. One of the things that we found recently about is about cemeteries, about a cemetery in uh, Harlan County, Kentucky, uh, is that the white section of the cemetery is all on find a grave, but none of the black graves are on. And these are graves with tombstones, like modern tombstones. Like there's like these are coal mining families, and so they they have good tombstones. Uh, it's not, not on, it's not on find a grave. So that's a, a whole nother project. <laughs> yeah. That, that, uh, that's crazy. Yeah. So you find all kinds of weird anomalous things like that, but the cemetery is one of the primary cultural markers for African-American communities, particularly historical African-American communities that may or may not be there anymore. Mm -hmm. So the church, the cemetery and the school were kind of these cultural infrastructure components that existed after emancipation that, that people had, like that's something that people had. Sometimes they didn't have a school, but they definitely had a church and a cemetery. And uh, those become the hubs uh, of the, and the remnants of these black communities. Yeah, and there's so many small, tiny cemeteries all throughout Appalachia that are just tucked away, sometimes in the woods. Uh, I know people who that have bought property and they're going to build a home and then they're, they're going up to their hills and they find an old family cemetery that, that you know, has been abandoned for many, many years. Uh, God only knows how many uh, cemeteries have been wiped out by things like surface mining uh, because companies will often go through and 
if they can get away with it, they'll wipe out a cemetery before anybody knows that it's there. Mm -hmm. And it's, the cemeteries are finding those things are, are important. And not just because, you know, it's, it's human remains there, but it's, uh, you know, cemeteries can tell a story too. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's important work. Like how many cemeteries do you think you guys have documented at this point? Uh, not, not, a, not a bunch, probably a dozen. Okay. That's still, yeah. that's still a fair yeah. amount. That, that's time consuming. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's it, that work never stops. There's uh, there's one here in Knoxville called citizen cemetery or good citizen cemetery. And it's got, it's speculated that Maurice Mays, the guy that the state executed for, from, you know, around the Knoxville race, riot. Mm -hmm. Uh, is buried in that one and it's just woods and it's just been and so then there's some ex-slaves buried in there as well so there's community members it cemetery good cemetery work requires a community group that is is out there every weekend chopping weeds or at least twice a year you know yeah so many small cemeteries don't get that kind of care and maintenance that they need uh, because the because sometimes the communities aren't there anymore, or the people that are connected to those families aren't there to take care of it. Uh, it's a real uh, I don't know kind of a tragic theme in Appalachian history. There's a lot of uh, well, well, I think of African American history in Appalachia, and, and when I think of unmarked graves, the very first thing that comes to mind is Hawk's Nest. And I don't know if you've ever been to Hawk's Nest. Uh, in Fayette County, West Virginia, but of course, many of the, the workers that were African American were buried in unmarked graves, any of some some in mass graves, and I just think about all the the loss of memory and the um, dehumanization uh, that is when 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 people's final resting place just gets kind of you know wiped out or or, or not not remembered, you know it's. It all it for me the cemetery work all boils down to labor, you know. Mm -hmm. There has to be somebody available and able to provide the labor to because that's all it is at this point. It's like you have to somebody has to be able to provide the labor to maintain mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, it in 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 a perfect world it would be a county, but you know, can the county even you know some counties can barely even keep the highways mowed so. Right. Yes, I'm familiar with that, particularly <laughs> in West Virginia. But it's important work because, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, removing monuments, uh, which I'm very much for, you know, like taking down Confederate monuments. But it's also important monuments that we reveal. And cemeteries are monuments. Uh, they are collections of monuments. And what we find and what we highlight says a lot about us as a society. So I'm glad uh, see that you guys are doing that. That's hard work and arduous work, and it takes a long time. Now, there's uh, you've got a lot of uh, talented people uh, that are working with you, Black and Appalachia. Can you tell us about some of those, tell us about your team that you've got there, and the podcast, and some of the other things that you guys do? Yeah, you can't can't do anything by yourself. That's mm -hmm. for sure. And um, probably like my my right hand woman my uh i guess i'm i'm robin and she's batman uh alana norwood uh uh is probably she's she's in johnson city tennessee and mm -hmm. so she she does a lot of the um historical research and scanning things in and and um cleaning things up and research with me and so uh so that's a lot of Norwood. She's she's a graduate of Berea College, recent graduate of Berea College, and so she's a dynamite uh, firecracker. And uh, and then the podcast team is a whole another group of firecrackers. <laughs> uh, there's Chris Chris Smith, who's the director of production development at East Tennessee PBS, and so he does. Uh, he's kind of the boss, even though he you know he likes to think he's the boss, but he's not the boss. Uh, and James Baines, who's the um, uh, uh, audio producer, he does the editing and 
and all that mixing and magical stuff like that. But then there's the the two hosts, and James is from um, uh, Chicago. He just he's part of this reverse migration back down. His his grandparents were from the south, but uh, once his grandmother, I guess his grandmother just recently passed away, but now he's back down south with his with his family, and he's he does a great job. Um, and uh, Dr. Nkeshi Alamin, who uh, is a sociologist at the University of Tennessee. She's the uh, producer and co-host, one of the producers and co-hosts of the Black and Appalachian podcast. And uh, she does a dynamite job. They, and Angela Dennis, who's a journalist uh, for the Knoxville News Sentinel and uh, writes about race uh, in the region as a, I guess, I don't know if it's a race reporter, it's a reporter on race. Mm -hmm. But she she um, she does all that really hard gut riching writing, uh, but um, there's somewhere I was going with this. Uh, oh, so they they the podcast team takes my takes a lot of the stuff that we've researched and and this kind of older history, and they take that stuff and kind of bring it into a modern context and kind of hold it up and look at it and say, okay, this happened in. 1919 but what's mm -hmm. this what's it mean today with black lives matter or any other kind of movement work um there's also a a, a whole bevy of like interns uh we're lucky enough to be able to work with uh have partnerships with academic institutions such as the university of tennessee school of information science but as, since the pandemic is is subsiding we've started to get more students from other colleges like the university of west or west virginia university and um um university of tennessee chattanooga mm -hmm. and so that's been really interesting uh to work with those students uh and they're working in support of of the work um yeah uh sounds and like had, a good team. We, and we had some high school students last semester do some work too over in boone north carolina uh, they wanted to do census work, and so they took on a piece and totally knocked it out of the park. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So you can't do any of this alone, and we continue to partner not only with our team, but we continue to partner with um, archives and museums, and you, you know that's the only way we can do any of this stuff. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's got a lot of great oral histories too on your site too. That, that I think are really important. You're kind of just building this huge digital archive, basically, is the, the kind of the way I look at it. It's a wonderful resource material and research material that, that's being built up. And it sounds like you guys are growing and you have more and more people that are interested. So that's a good thing. Um, I want to ask you a couple more, a little bit more philosophical type questions here as we get towards the end here. Um, you know, Appalachian scholars for you know decades and decades have been talking about the supposed arguing about the uniqueness or except or actual Appalachian exceptionalism. Yeah, uh, Ron Lewis that I studied under at WVU, he would he would always tell me Appalachia is unique, but it's not exceptional. Uh, that was always his big line that he would tell me. I like that. It's unique, but it's not exceptional. Do you think that the when you think about the African American experience in Appalachia, do you think uh, do you see a unique history or do you see it more just in tune with the mainstream of African-American history and culture in the rest of America? Where do you place that? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, the black experience in, in Appalachia from my, from my perspective, the black experience in, in Appalachia is, is not that unique. Um, and certainly not that exceptional. I think that there are some, there are some kind of uh, there are some exceptions, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the black communities in, in I think in southeastern Ohio, with that being a free state uh, for a long time. And the contradictions that exist there uh, with mm -hmm. a lot of things, I think that that's an exceptional. Uh, the black communities in southeastern Ohio is a very exceptional case. Um, but largely apart from that, I think a lot of the black communities in, in Appalachia were, were existing within the South. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Appalachia is the South. I, I've heard some people say like, you know, they say like, 
Appalachia, the South and Appalachia. And I don't, I, I, it really drives me crazy because, you know, I'm, I'm partial to Appalachia. I, I like to think that there's all kinds of cool things about Appalachia mm -hmm. that I like, but I think separating Appalachia from the South and what you're really saying is black and white, right? Like you're saying okay. Appalachia in the South, you're saying, well, black land and white land. And to me, that's what it sounds mm -hmm. like. And so I think that, um, yeah, I think that Appalachia is, um, is not exceptional and it's certainly part of the South and uh, the history of the South and Appalachia are parallel and inextricable from each other. Okay. And Jim Crow, uh, lynchings, uh, slavery, segregation. So I'm hard pressed to find anything that makes it different, makes Appalachia, black communities in Appalachia different from the rest of the South. Southeastern Ohio has some weird, has some weird history. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're, 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 and Keshi says this thing, like everything South of the Canadian border is the South. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I really wanted to get your thoughts on that. Also, um, what are your thoughts on, um, but by the way, about the, uh, I've been meaning to ask you about music. I know we're kind of running short on time here. But um, do we have a time limit? Well, really, uh, don't we? we really don't. So we could just uh, we could just talk, you know, of course, you know, you know, the banjo was brought up into Appalachia, for example, uh, with the African-American uh, uh, railroad workers. And uh, always is the irony of, you know, when a lot of people think of the banjo, they think of hillbillies, white trash, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it wasn't that. And uh, I was uh, wondering if uh, there's if you guys are doing anything about the the black musical traditions in Appalachia. You know, I found uh, a Smithsonian Folkways uh, album about uh, Appalachian blues, hmm. and I found it in Brooklyn. I was I was in Brooklyn in a record store, and I found Appalachian blues. I thought, what on earth is this? I've never seen this before and it was a collection of old Appalachian blues guitar players like Pink Anderson and uh, a lot of these other uh, old Tommy uh, blues musicians, acoustic bass blues with a lot of harmonica. I was trying to really find the differentiation between that blues and blues you would hear like say Memphis or Miss, uh, Mississippi Delta. Uh, there's not really that much difference, a little bit in the finger picking style of the way the guitarists play and a lot of harmonica in Appalachian blues. But I was wondering if uh, Black and Appalachia has anything on the horizon in which they might be uh, looking into that musical tradition. Well, so what you've done is, uh, and I was trying to find the name of this book that I'd found uh, about jazz and blues in Southern West Virginia. Yeah, yeah, the, there's a Coal Town Jazz book that came out uh, six or seven years ago, maybe a little bit more older than that. It's like jazz and big band jazz and blues in West Virginia, Southern West Virginia, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Anyways, that I think that I would love to uh, get into some of the history around Bluefield and some of those those places that, that had this rich jazz and blues tradition. So I, I say that to say like music history is not my forte. Like mm -hmm. I, I know... I know enough to get me in trouble. Like we did a short documentary about Leslie Riddle uh, and Dom Flemons was gracious enough to help us out with that one. And, you know, Dom Flemons like knows all the, like knows all the things and all the like little intricacies and names that led. To, mm -hmm. I, I don't know enough. I know just enough about uh, black musical tradition to get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> okay. I, as someone who is not musically inclined, music has always seemed like this magical thing that I just uh, marvel at. Mm -hmm. But I, I am really interested in the uh, the the jazz and blues traditions that that came through the mountains in, in Bluefield, West Virginia, and and in Knoxville. Knoxville is kind of this place where uh, jazz and mountain music kind of touched each other mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways, and so. I, I am interested in that um, secret, secret squirrel though. We are working on a, a, on a documentary, a broader documentary about black radio stations, okay. uh, black owned radio stations. Um, uh, let the cat out of the bag. We're, we're not even close to being done with that thing, but uh, uh, 
maybe somebody will jump out ahead of us and then we won't have to do do much labor. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, I think that, that that would be really interesting. I would just need, so Kelly Jolly is also on our team. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she is a musician, she's a storyteller and uh, she is the one that in, on our team that knows music and she knows like all the intricacies. There's King Pleasure who, uh, who is a, a musician that came out of uh, Morgan town, Morgan County, West uh, Morgan County, Tennessee okay. camps. And uh, she talks about him a lot. And I think those really obscure unknown people, I think I would love to tell those stories, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to drive the boat. I would just have to put press record on the camera and, and edit. Uh, mm -hmm. things. Well, I, 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 I love to see some stuff out of the radio uh, station. It sounds really, really interesting because uh, I, I would love to hear, hear more about that. And yeah. James Brown had uh, we here in Knoxville have WJBE, which was once owned by James. It was founded by James Brown. So <laughs> James Brown had a series of radio stations and he may have had a radio station in West Virginia. Really? I, I've heard tale whether it's true or not um, is up for Google to decide. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to find that out. Yeah. Uh, there was a big jazz was really popular in a lot of the coal towns. They did a lot of uh, jazz bands toward the coal towns, late thirties, early forties mm -hmm. is when you had a big uh, surge of that, uh, at least in, in West Virginia, uh, I know of. And it's, again, it's a part of our, of our history and part of our culture that you don't hear a lot about. You wouldn't think of jazz bands being popular in West Virginia in the late thirties and forties, but uh, the, it's one of those things that adds layers to the complexity of the stereotypical Appalachian narrative. That I and think what's interesting to me is like the jazz band. I hear more about jazz in West Virginia than I do in any other. And that may be because I don't know than any other Appalachian uh, state, um, you know, region of a state, mm -hmm. um, maybe Pittsburgh. I, I, I don't know, but um, it's really interesting to me. Okay, a um, couple other quick uh, questions, but I wanted, also wanted to ask you about this. Uh, you hear the term, do you use the term Afrolatchian? I don't, no, I don't use okay. the term Afrolatchian, but people okay. do, especially a lot of younger people like to use that word. Yeah, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on the term. I know some people use it, some people don't. I, I think it's I think it's fine. It's kind of like, you know, people are celebrating Juneteenth this year. And, uh, you know, in our region, it was the 8th of August. I think in, like, parts of West Virginia, it was uh, September 22nd. They celebrated mm -hmm. emancipation. So I, I don't I don't poo-poo the use of, of Afro-Latchian. It just doesn't, it's not, doesn't fit for how I view myself or, or how I, uh, how I describe my, my community and the, and the people I interact with. I don't, but, I, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't call myself that. Okay. Uh, yeah. I wanted to know what, what, what your thoughts were on it. I know some people do, some people don't wanted to see. And I noticed that I didn't hear it in any of the, uh, uh the podcast or anything that I've listened to from black and Appalachia. I haven't really heard the term used. Yeah. I hadn't, I've never grew, I didn't grow up hearing that. And so I feel like there's, I'm, account I'm accountable to people, so I can't just throw it out there without community, <laughs> the community being like, yeah, that's what we want to be called. So Right. Right. Okay. One more question for you I've got is if, if somebody's wanting to read more or learn more about the Black experience in Appalachia, uh, aside from your website, aside from the, the material that they find online, where would you direct them? Somebody asked me, I'm going to send them to, the first thing I'm going to send them to is Joe Trotter. Um, yep. that's kind of, uh, kind of the, 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 uh, one of the founding fathers maybe uh, of, uh, blacks and Appalachia, but what are some books, uh, or authors that you would direct people to, to get themselves better educated? Yeah, I have, I, I when I saw your list now books are like, I love books, books are a mm -hmm. thing. So I've started doing this thing recently. See, I actually put a little list together for you guys and I can pay, paste it somewhere. Where would I paste it? I don't know. Um, anyways, I'll just, uh, you can put you. it in private chat. Oh, post in the comments. Boop. Oh, there's lots of comments here. Um, I don't know how to comment myself. 
anyways, we'll, uh, boop. I don't either. I'm completely at the mercy of Kenzie. I hope that uh, William didn't just drop himself out there because he's gone. Uh, he might be back in a moment. I hope so. Let's give him a second or two to come back. Back uh, While we're uh, waiting on William to show back up, I believe we may have a question. Do we have any questions from the audience? There you are. Uh, that's, don't, just don't go clicking around, apparently. Um, <laughs> so don't do that to anybody. Right. But, okay, so books. We'll, we'll, uh, so I'll start doing this thing. Um, finding more recently and more interesting are these uh, – kind of homemade books by these public historians. Um, there's one uh, called, and so I would encourage you to like, if there's any like homemade local books, like those things are really good. Oftentimes mm -hmm. they're less academic and they don't have an index in the back oftentimes, but uh, this one, uh, cause I'm colored the black heritage of Ta Tazewell County. Okay. Which is based oral on history. oral histories. I really like that one. And uh, this one is kind of a public historian as well. Slavery in Southeastern Kentucky, buried history. So this uh, is Joe Spencer. Okay. So these are, these are two that I've really inter been really interested in lately. Um, but uh, this one here is really good. Uh, it's written by Philip J. Obermiller and uh, oh, yeah. Thomas Wagner, African American mm -hmm. miners and migrants. Uh, and it talks about, uh, the broad kind of um, networking between black communities in the mountains, especially coal camps. Yeah. Over uh, there, does some great work on migration out of Appalachia. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe I can just put, paste it in here. Oh my goodness. Um, That's okay. Kenzie is putting some of them up here. Okay, cool. Um, um, uh, also, if you're interested in Eastern Kentucky, uh, Carita Brown, uh, gone home is really good. Uh, her family's from, Harlan County, Kentucky, and uh, she's a descendant of coal miners, but she's also an amazing sociologist that uses uh, oral history interviews and incorporates those as primary sources. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, there's uh, this one, this one, for those with like interested in West Virginia uh, stuff, this could be a starting point, but this one warped my head really good. Uh, it's called uh, Grassroots Garveyism. Uh, the Universal Negro Improvement Association in the rural South. There were in West Virginia, there was quite a few uh, uh, Marcus Gar uh, UNIA chapters in West Virginia, which mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know. And I would love for somebody else to do some research on that. But that that book is really good. And it, it warped warped my head uh, really in a, in a good way. Uh, How did it warp your head in a good way? It, it changed my perception of of the UNIA, okay. uh, which growing up or at least learning about that, uh, I always assumed like when I thought of like the Garveyites or Universal Negro Improvement Association, I thought of like Harlem and Chicago and, and you know, you know, like you see like um, like Malcolm X, like, you know, uptown Harlem in, in, in that, that time period, like you just think like... Um, you, I think of those urban centers, but the bulk of the UNIA was in the rural South mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, think of that. which blew my mind. And mm -hmm. uh, because if you think it was all about self-defense, it was all about like, you know, doing what you need to do to maintain your, your own community and families. And like, you know, you're not trying to like, um, you're trying to stand on your own two feet in a lot of ways. So, you know, some of that is kind of bootstrappy kind of thing, but it's not, um, it's not, it, you know, people did what they had to do. Yeah. Put this in there. And then, um, also for West Virginia, a book that I really like uh, and read a couple of times is Black Huntington by mm -hmm. Cic Cicero Fane. That's a really good one. Um, Cicero does a really good job. Um, mm -hmm. it's a good book. Yeah. And yeah. So I, I don't know. And of course, blacks in Appalachia by Bill Turner, um, mm -hmm. and Trotter. And there, here's a, a book that I've been reading recently that has nothing to do with Appalachia is, uh, is called, uh, decolonizing resistance. It's about anarchism in the Philippines. 
Okay. It, it talks about um, uh, the, and I, I and I think that it's like there's some applicable stuff to our region because it talks about how uh, instead of um, organizing a, what would be considered state lines here, it would be um, uh, organizing via an archipelago. So this collection, mm -hmm. these islands of communities that are interconnected, which is for me it seems really similar to Appalachia. Hmm. We don't have the ocean, but we've got mountains that keep us keep our communities apart. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Well, thanks for for those recommendations, and I hope that uh, people can take some of those and do some reading. Uh, let's. Uh, do we have any uh, audience questions? By the way, I'm glad you made a quick recovery and came back because I was gonna. <laughs> I don't I know if we break out. out my guitar and maybe play a tune or something. I don't know what I was going to do. So <laughs> uh, uh, waiting on you to get back here. Okay. Patricia Brown has a question. Is Rez William done any research on West Virginia African-American businessmen and women? So here's the thing, West Virginia peoples. Uh, so we usually don't go into communities and start doing work unless we're invited. And so if somebody from a community invites us in and wants help with, with a particular thing, uh, that's when we uh, will come visit. So uh, if there's a community that, that you're interested in, that you live in or you're from, uh, and you there's components that you want to help flush, want us to help flush out, um, invite us and we'll come. But we don't uh, just stroll in. We always have to have an invite from community members. Okay. So a uh, long way. We've not been invited to West Virginia yet, but we're coming in August. So we're going to come to the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum. And yes. Visit. yes. Well, um, yes, I, I'm giving you an invite uh, to that. Uh, I would love to see Black and Appalachia do some work, say, for on Keystone oh, yeah. uh, uh, in McDowell County uh, on the McDowell Times, the, the newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to see more. And I guess I'm the museum is going to have to do this uh, or, or some other research. I would like to know more about the African-American experience in and around uh, Blair Mountain. There's really not a lot there. When I, I know that the community, for example, was divided. Uh, the McGow Times, the one black newspaper in, in West Virginia, uh, condemned the march on Blair Mountain oh. and uh, was very much, you know, uh, trying to get the African-American community not to uh, join up with that. Uh, but that, that was right out of uh, produced right near Key Keystone where you had some more middle class uh, uh, black families may, and it's you know, a speculation because Blair Mountain was less than 90 days removed from Tulsa and a lot of other things. Maybe they were fearing reprisals if uh, African-Americans, too many of them joined up, but it's, uh, I don't know, something that needs to be researched. There's so many gaps, so many gaps in, in the history. But uh, I, I'm really thrilled that you guys are, are have taken on the mantle of really filling in a much, much needed open space uh, in our uh, collective memory there with Black and Appalachia. And yeah, Bill Turner mentioned Keystone to us, too. So uh, he's like, y'all to go up to Keystone. Yeah. So um, uh, he's similarly has mentioned it as well. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a really, really unique place and there's very little written about it. Howard B. Lee writes about it a little bit in his book, Bloodletting in Appalachia, mm -hmm. but uh, not a lot. There, there's not there's not a lot there. But uh, that's why we that's why we keep doing what we do is uh, we just fill in the gaps one brick at a time, so to speak. But uh, William, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you uh, for taking the time to talk to us and share your work with us. Uh, we uh, hope to uh, see you here in a month or so and uh, get to meet some of your crew. I hope to be down there uh, when you're uh, when you show up in Matewan. And uh, and, you know, who knows, maybe there are projects in the future that uh, the museum and uh, Black and Appalachian, maybe we can coordinate on and uh, do do some do some things together. So. Yeah, that would be fun. I would, I would love I'd love to get up into West Virginia and get to hang out with y'all. Yeah, well, we we'll look forward to it. Well, once again, William, thanks so much for joining us. And guys, that is all for episode three. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode. Thanks again, William, and thanks for everybody that watched. Take care and have a good summer. <laughs>